tonight, I want to just go ahead and dive right in to the Word. Um, if you have a Bible with you, if you don't have Bibles, we have a ton in the back, and also the verses are going to come up behind me. Um, or if you have a phone, I'm sure you have a Bible in it. But um, try to follow along with me because we are going to read quite a bit. Um, so come with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews is in the New Testament, all after Paul's letters. You can find Hebrews. Hebrews 12, we're going to start reading from verse 18. You can just follow along with me. It says, For you have not come, as did the Israelites in the wilderness, to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire, and to gloom and darkness and, ra and a raging windstorm, and to the blast of a trumpet and a sound of words such, such that those who heard it begged and nothing more be said to them, for they could not bear the command, if even a wild animal touches the mountain, it will be stoned to death. In fact, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am filled with fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the, Jeru the heavenly Jerusalem, and, to the, and the angels in a festive gathering, and to the general assembly and the assembly of the firstborn who are registered as citizens at heaven, and to God, who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, the redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect bringing them to their final glory, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, united God and men, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. See to it that you do not refuse to listen to him who is speaking to you now. For if those sons of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to him, who warned them on earth, revealing God's will, how much less will we escape if we turn our backs on him who warns from heaven? His voice shook the earth at Mount Sinai, but then, but, but now he has given a promise, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the starry heaven." Now the, this expression, yet once more, indicates the removal and final transformation of all those things that can be shaken, of that which has been created, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude and offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is indeed a consuming fire. You may be th thinking, what did she just read? That was a whole lot. And it was. And, and to be honest with you, I am aware that this is a very, very strange passage. There's a lot in here, but um, the Bible tells us in Romans 15, 4, that everything in the Bible was written um, to teach us, yes? So that through endurance taught in scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So there's lessons in the, in the word of God, even in the weird passages, even in the passages that we would look at and be like... <sighs> I'm going to skip over this one, and I'm going to go to Psalms. Yes, we, we tend to do that. No, Hebrews is weird. I'm going to read Psalms and maybe, you know, some John or whatever. But let's not, yes, let's, let's together walk through this passage because I truly believe there's valuable lessons in here. And, and we're going to walk through it together, and we're going to see why it's talking about kingdoms and mountains and all these things. Yes, because there is something that God is trying to speak to us today. So let's quickly pray and we'll, we'll get into it, yes? Lord, we just thank you so much for today and we thank you that your word is alive and that it speaks to us, to our situation. It, it speaks to each one of us where we're at and, and tonight we just pray that you would do just that, that you would speak to us, that you would open up our eyes, that we'd be able to see you and see how much we truly need you, God, and and that we wouldn't walk out of this place the same, but rather we would embrace what you're saying to us and, and be able to walk in it, Lord. And we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for what you're already doing. We thank you for being here. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So 
the very first section of this passage um, is talking about two mountains. Yes, did you notice that? It mentions two mountains. It mentions Mount Sinai and Mount Sion. If you've had any um, time to read the Old Testament, you may remember that Mount Sinai um, is the mountain where God gives his law. Yes, the mountain, you know, in Easter when the movies, those old movies of Moses and the law. Yeah, exactly. This happened here in real life, okay? Um, Mount Sinai. Sinai uh, is specifically where God met with Moses and handed him the tablets of the law. Now, um, this specific section is referring to Exodus 19, and I actually want to read it to you. You don't have to go there. I'm going to throw it all the way back to Exodus, and it'll be right there in the screen. Um, but what's happening here is God is telling Moses, hey, I'm about to do this, and I want you to prepare the people. I want you to tell them to come. I want you to tell them to come close to the mountain, not up the mountain. Only you are going to come up the mountain, but they can be around it, yes? And God wants them to hear what he's about to explain to Moses because he wants them to hear his voice. Very interesting. He wants them to be able to hear what he's saying, but they're not allowed to come any closer. So Exodus 19, verse 9, says this. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may believe and trust in you forever. So he wants to be heard but not seen almost, right? Obviously, that doesn't happen because we're going to see in a minute how this whole situation looked. Um, God was going to give them the law, but if you may remember, anybody who saw God, what happened? They died, yes? It was in the Old Testament, if they got too close or if they saw him, it wasn't that great. So it was that very special that Moses got to go up the mountain and be with him and talk to him and hear him basically face to face. But that wasn't the setup for everybody. There was actually a barrier around the mountain. And that's what it's saying also in Hebrews, that even if animals came up and touched it, they would die. So God was trying to protect them. Come close, hear my voice, but only so close. Now, the moment came, and everybody was gathering at the foot of the mountain, and Moses again reminded them, don't touch anything. Just stand there and listen, okay? Just stand there and listen, and God is going to talk to us. He's going to speak to us. Now, Exodus 20, 18, tells us how they reacted to this, and this is what happened. Now all the people witnessed the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of trumpet and the smoking mountain. And as they looked, the people were afraid and they trembled and moved backward and stood at a safe distance. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Now when I read this, I had to read it again. I was like, maybe I'm reading it wrong. But the truth, <laughs> the truth is that this is what they said to him. Listen, man, this is terrifying. We're going to back away now. You tell us what he's saying and what we need to do, but we don't want to hear. We don't even want to hear his voice. We don't want to be here. We don't want to hear anything. We just want to know what we're meant to do and go on with our lives. Take, take a moment to just think about that. God set it up so that they could be safe. He was protecting them. He wanted to be there. He wanted them to hear him. He wanted them to be present with this happen, but they decided that hearing from Moses would be safer than hearing from God. They said, this is better. Just tell us what to do. And to be honest, I'm not judging. I'm not judging them at all. Just looking at this verse, I'm thinking this was probably a very frightening spectacle. There was flashes of lightning, there was thunder, there was sounds of trumpets, and there was nobody playing trumpets. You know, there was all these things happening, and they were standing there like, what is about to happen to us? They were afraid. They were definitely afraid. And then they looked to Moses, and he said, this guy's not going to hurt us. Let's just hear from him. He can just tell us what to do. This is our safe choice. Let's hear from Moses. Sadly, though, God's purpose had always been for them to be his people. God 
never wanted just to give them rules. And he never just wanted to tell them how to behave. He never just wanted to be like, this is all the things you must do to please me. No, that wasn't his heart. His heart was for them to be his people, his children. He wanted to be known by them. He wanted to be known by them, but they thought he is too scary, too intimidating. We are not doing this. We are choosing Moses instead. Now, if we go back to our verse in Hebrews, it compares this mountain that we just looked at to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is usually, um, it talks of, when it talks about Mount Zion in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's talking about us, the church. It's talking about the church or the New Jerusalem, you know, when Jesus comes and, and all that. But I want you to read, read it with me really quickly. We'll just read that passage. Um, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the angels in a festive gathering, and to the general assembly and assembly of the firstborn who are registered as citizen in heaven, and to God who is the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous who are redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect, bringing them their final glory. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, uniting God and men. And to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel which cried out for vengeance. I love that it starts, but you. Because it's saying, yes, this is, this is the way it used to be, but this isn't the way that it is for us. For you, it's different. You have come, and you have come to an open way. You can come in. You can come into this mountain. You can come up this mountain. There is no barriers holding you back. Nobody's telling you how far you need to step away from God. He is calling you in to his presence. He's calling you in. Jesus already made a way. He mediated between us and the Father. There is no need for a Moses. There's no need for anybody telling us what he's saying or what he wants to do or how we must do this. He's already speaking to you. You are welcome. You are welcome in his presence. The, uh, because of the cross and because of what Christ did, his blood covers our sins. His blood covers our imperfections. He calls us to come close because he's speaking and he wants us to hear. He wants us to make sure that we hear what he's trying to say, which is exactly what verse 25 says back in Hebrews. Sorry, Marius, you're doing a great job. <laughs> verse 25 says, see to it that you do not refuse to listen to him who is speaking to you now. That, just that phrase stuck out to me. See to it that you do not refuse to him that is speaking to you now. Because if the people of Israel could not escape when they refused him, how are we going to escape if we refuse him? It keeps on saying. Verse 26 says, His voice shook the earth then, and now he is given a promise, yet once more he will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. He's speaking to us. And please understand me when I say, because there's confusion, right? So is God audibly speaking to some people nowadays? Some people want to say, well, why are some of you hearing him and I'm not? You know, why don't I get a burning bush or a speaking donkey or something? You know, like, how is this fair? How did they get that? And we don't, you know? And it, I, I don't even know, guys. But the truth is... <laughs> We would love that. We would love the signs and the wonders and the big things and the speaking donkeys and all these crazy things, but he's speaking to you now. He's always speaking to you. Not even just here. He's speaking to you every single time you come into his presence. He's speaking to you every time you open his word. He has left absolutely everything you need to know when you hold that book in your hands. Everything. There's no secrets. There's nothing he's hiding. His heart, his character, his mind, the way he sees things, the way he loves you, the way he is, who he is. Everything is depicted in there. There's no secrets. There's nothing that he is holding back. He is speaking to you all the time. 
And yet sometimes we refuse it. Sometimes we, we don't even open it. We forget to come into his presence. But the truth of the matter is, is that the more that we dig in, the more that we come into his presence, the more that we will know him. And that is all he's ever wanted. His desire has always been relationship with you. It was relationship with the children of Israel and it's relationship with you that he wants. He doesn't want you to have a big old head full of knowledge so that you can dissect him and have all these debates. Debates are wonderful. I love to debate. But, you know, like he is not just interested in you know him, like knowing about him. He wants you to know him. There's a difference. There's a massive difference. He wants to be known by you. He wants to personally have a relationship with you. And there's a reason why. Because there's going to come a day when everything you know is shaken. And that is exactly what it's saying. The next verse was saying. There's going to come a day when everything is shaken. Anything and everything in your life that can be shaken will be shaken at some point. It will. You will find it. You will sense it. Maybe like Diane was saying, it was hitting her thing after thing. Everything in her life was shaken. And it happens. It happens to all of us. And when that time comes, he wants you to know that he's there. He wants you to already know who he is. He wants you to already know what he is about and what he thinks of you. He wants you to already know how good he is and how faithful he is and how he wants to provide for you and how he wants to take you through this. But if you don't know that, if we don't learn to know him, if we don't have a personal relationship with him, then how are we going to stand? Verse 27 of Hebrews says just that. It says, This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed, so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. If you think about it, this isn't just for our personal lives, even though it is. It is getting harder and harder to be a Christian. Just look around you. Look at the news. Look at anybody who actually believes in God and says that the Bible is their truth. Is soon enough going to have a harder and harder time. It's not going to be the most popular thing to be a Christian. It's already not the most popular thing in lots of places. So when you are personally targeted, when people don't like what you think, when people don't like what you believe, is he enough to you? Is he real to you? Do you know what you believe? Do we even know what we believe or why we believe it? And in your personal lives, when the waves come crashing down over and over and over again, when you're in a storm, when you're being shaken, are you standing in that unshakable kingdom? Jesus is that unshakable kingdom. He is the hope of glory. He is our joy now. He is our ultimate reward. He is it. It's not something else that he's going to pull out of the bag. It's him. He is it. But do you believe that? Do you know this? The author of Hebrews is trying to say to us, look, a long time ago, the Israelites refused them because they were afraid. They didn't know him. So just looking from the outside, he looked terrifying. The smoke and the thunder and the fire and all the stuff. Yes, he looked pretty terrifying because there was no relationship at all whatsoever. They didn't want it. They didn't want, they shied away from his voice. They chose the safer thing. They chose Moses so they could see whom they thought was safer. They could not go up the mountain. They couldn't be with him. And that, I'm, I'm assuming that's a lot harder to believe him when you can't see him, but neither can we. And here we are today. But the thing for us is that we can get to know him, that we can walk into his presence, that we can 
hear his voice and be led by his spirit, that we can worship in his presence. But he is serious, though. When he says, do not refuse this, do not choose some other voice, do not go rely on some other thing or some other safety or some other person because there's going to come a day when you're going to wish that you were standing on solid ground. There's going to come a day when everything you have and everything you're holding on to is going to be shaken in your life. And what are you going to find? Where are your feet planted? I can tell you from personal experience that God allows or brings shakings into our lives so that we can actually see where we're standing because we may think that we're doing great life is great we have everything that we need and if you've known me for a while now you've probably heard already you know like before we came here we had everything that we thought we wanted we had a great job we lived in a beautiful place we had friends we had um We had everything that we dreamed of. We were building our life, and we thought this was it for forever. Absolutely, we never, ever came in islands just like Diane was not. I didn't even know this place existed, right? I had no idea it was a thing. So my brother moved here, and then I was like, oh, it's a nice vacation spot, yes? But no, never in my life to live here? No. And I was very upset (laughs) because God started shaking everything in our lives. He started disrupting my plans and my dreams. He started messing with everything. And I needed that. The truth is that he was tugging at our hearts and he was telling us it was time to move. It was time to get out of where we were. It was time to stop relying on so many other things but him. And now I am, I'm I'm a little embarrassed to say that I was very unpleased with him. I was very upset because he took, I felt as if he had taken everything away. He shook so hard that my plans were gone, my friends were gone, our jobs were gone, our reputation was gone, everything was gone. And I found myself overwhelmed and exposed in a way that I wasn't planning on being. And I looked around and I I saw that everything that I depended on and everything that I called safety or assurance in my life wasn't there anymore. I didn't have my plans. I didn't have my life. I didn't have the people that were feeding into that security. Everything was gone. And it showed me my heart. And I needed to see my heart because my heart was full of idols. It was full, full of other things so many other things that were competing with him. And you could say, well, weren't you a missionary and like somewhere? (laughs) Yes, I was. Our life was church. (laughs) That's all we did. We served God. We, We breathed God. Yes, we were in the church all day long. We preached. We spoke. We served everything. This was our life. And yet, there was so much fighting in our hearts for his attention. There was so much in our hearts that we were holding on to other than him. I believe the lies that apart from the place that I was, God would never use us again. We thought we had lost everything. And yet, after he shook everything out of our lives, I came to find that I had gained the one thing that truly mattered. Him. I saw him clearly. Not through the glass of all these other things that I needed or I thought that I needed, but it was just him. It was just him and me. It almost felt like Psalm 40, verse 2 and 3. It says, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, steadying my footsteps and establishing my path. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear with great reverence and will trust confidently in the Lord. When all those other things were shaken out of my life, I had to ask myself a very difficult question. Is he enough for me? Nobody wants to answer that question. 
Because we would like to have one foot on the rock and one foot on something else, anything else, everything else. Our money, our job, our security, our family, our husbands, our children, you name it, you know it, I don't know it. But we like to have the safety of something else. And he was saying, no, I'm not competing for your heart. I'm not competing for your attention. It's me or when I shake, you're going down. And he did. And I almost went down, but I'm glad he didn't let me. But I had to ask, is he real to me? Is he enough to me? Because he wants to be the only one. And we come to know him as the unshakable hope in our lives when everything else has been shaken off. And that is the final part of the passage. Verse 28 says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with a holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Once we see this, it should produce in us a thankfulness and awe, such reverence, such worship. The very thing that produced fear in the Israelites' hearts should bring comfort to ours. The very thing that made them shake in their boots, that made them tremble, the, the thunder and the lightning and the magnificence of his presence should comfort us. We should look at him and go, he is a consuming fire. He is amazing. He is this magnificent God. And he is on my side. And he cares for me. And he wants to know me intimately, personally. He wants to speak to me. He wants me to know who he is. That should bring comfort and rest and peace into our lives. We must know and remember who he is and remember he is worthy of our entire lives. Of our entire lives. And if this is the truth in our lives, if he is our everything, then nothing can be taken from you. Even when life comes at you, even when you're totally shaken, even when you lose so many things, you still have everything you need because you have him. He's there. He's still there. He never shakes. He never goes away. He will never be taken from you. Psalm 62 verse 5 says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. I have absolutely no idea where you find yourself today. Maybe you're looking afar in fear, like the children of Israel. Maybe you're saying, this, this God is terrifying. I don't know that I want any part of this. Maybe he seems intimidating still because you haven't gotten to know him. But those that believe in him, those that belong to him, have an open way into his presence. Maybe you are in the middle of being shaken. Maybe everything you ever held on to for dear life is falling to pieces today. And maybe it's time to ask ourselves, is he enough? Do I really know him? We all need the same thing, no matter where we find ourselves. We need Jesus. We need him to steady our feet on the rock. We need him to draw us to himself. We need him to reveal himself to us. We need to open his word and we need to dig in and we need to ask him, please speak to me. I'm listening. I want to hear you, Lord. I want to know you. And that is my prayer for us tonight, that we would come to know him, not just know about him, not just do the nice things that surround him, but that we would know him, who he is personally to you, for you, so that no matter what comes in your life and in my life, we won't be shaken. Let's pray. God, we just thank you. We thank you, God, that you are indeed a magnificent God, that you are indeed a consuming fire, that you are indeed great, God, that you are 
that you do make the, ache, the earth shake and tremble with just the sound of your voice. For we are thankful that we have an open way to you, that it, we can enter into your presence freely, that if we are in Christ, if we belong to you, then you have us and you're fighting for us. And this would not be a cause for fear that you are so great and that you are a consuming fire, but that it would be comforting to us to know that you are on our side and that you love us, God. God, I pray for each one of us here that we would come to know you, you, not just things about you and not just things that surround you, but that you would become the only one in our life that you would become the ground that we're standing on, that you would become un our unshakable ground and our unshakable kingdom, our hope, our eternal hope, that no matter what comes our way or what life throws at us, we're still standing at the end of the day because we're standing on you. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence. Help us not to shy away from you. Help us to hear you calling our names drawing us to you, God, and let us answer and come into your presence so that we can find you and know you even more. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.